Good afternoon again and welcome. This is another one of the Veteran Forum programs. And as usual, we have another young guy here who's finally going to come and tell us some of the things that he did. His name is Bill Mulholland. I'll let him introduce himself to you, spell his name and so forth, and then we'll take the show on the road. Bill, you're on if you will, please. Thank you. I, I'm Bill Mulholland. Um, I've been a, uh, a resident of Beckett since 1950. And um, I taught at Berkshire Community College for about 15 years, and oh. now I'm the Dean of Lifelong Learning and Workforce Development at the college. Okay. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about my military experience and a little bit about my dad's, who uh, retired as a professor and oh. chair of the history department in 1989 when I went to work as a professor. Okay, so it's kind of space. sibling training then. Yep. Huh? Yep. Okay, let's start a little bit. What was your branch of service and what were your active duty dates? I was in the Air Force uh, from um, April 1966 to, until April 1970. In your area? Nam? I was in Vietnam. Okay. Strangely enough, I volunteered to go there. Why is it strange? Um, well, um, a lot of people didn't volunteer to go there. Um, That's strange. I was, uh, what was strange about it was that uh, at the time I was stationed in, uh, in Tampa and I thought the weather was too hot. That was a mistake. <laughs> you learned real quick, I'll <laughs> I did. Okay. I did. Well, well, now that we got an idea that you, you yeah, were Air Force type, that's a bad way to put it, but you served that the works. Air Force. Uh, let's build a little history, if you will. Like, where were you born? When were you born? And, and how was it growing up before you went into the service? What kind of a lifestyle did you have? What did you um, do? I was born in um, Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, my father was a career officer in the Air Force. Uh, he was a pilot. Um, so from the time I was born, um, uh, we traveled all around the country. We lived in, in uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, um, uh, uh, California twice, um, and until, until finally 1960 when my f father retired at Westover. So we were Air Force brats, um, my, my two other brothers and sister, and, and just being hooked to the military was just something that we, that was, was your part lifestyle. of our life. Yeah. Now, what was that like, as I say, growing up as a, young, as a brat, and I'll use the term just that one time. Yeah. What did uh, it do for you, and how did it give you a feeling of what's going on? Um, it, uh, it was the only thing we knew. We thought it was kind of neat pulling up stakes and, and, and moving about every three years because we, we were used to it. I think looking back in, in the rearview mirror, it was difficult from a school standpoint. It was, um, it was disruptive, yeah. um, particularly in the early years where you're learning all those basic skills to pull up from. Uh, in, I, I went to first grade in uh, Beckett, Massachusetts and finished the last quarter in uh, San Bernardino, California in first grade. So that was, th th that was uh, tough uh, making th those kinds of transitions. But it was an exciting life and we enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. oh, it also it must have interrupted that thing called making friends and so forth. Uh, you had your little group of people, but bingo, they'd leave or you'd leave. And do you ever get in touch with some of those guys be, uh, as a means of keeping together? We really didn't. Uh, we didn't, and we, we just know it, knew it went with the territory that, that, that when it was time to pull up stakes, it was... Uh, we, that was it. We were always traveling, hopefully, and, uh, yeah. and we looked forward to the next place that we were going to transfer to. Any particular ones that stand right out even today that were real gems, if you will, as opposed to, oh, oh here we go again kind of stuff? Um, the, 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 the one that was the gem was moving back to Beckett. We bought the house in Beckett in 1950, only stayed there for a few months, came back when my father was sent to Korea, and we stayed there. We were little kids, stayed there for a year with my mother while he was in Korea. And then we shipped out to California. And when we finally knew, that was the only place that was, we called home. We used to call it the house that smiled. Oh, And uh, in Why? Beckett, what well, was ours, and it was a big old 200 year old colonial. And it was just, it was the only place that we knew was ours. And when we found out we were gonna come back. Um, a good warm it, feeling. It was, it was. And uh, we, we just, and I can still, I can still remember walking in the house, uh, smelling the lilacs. Uh, in May, and just how green it was coming from San Bernardino, California, and um, that was a great experience. Yeah, great. Now, 
What was your schooling before you went in the service? Uh, high school, any sorts of special activities, any sports that uh, you took part in, or weren't you there long enough to make a team? Um, I w well, um, by the time I started high school, I, I, um, uh, my father was retired, and he went into teaching. And um, I didn't do great in high school, and um, I was in a rock and roll band, and I thought that I could make a living playing fun, fun, fun for the rest of my life. And it didn't, didn't, didn't. I didn't. And I went to Berkshire Community College. My father was a professor there. Um, and I flunked out miserably um, <laughs> in 1965. Um, I had three Fs and two Ds. I was hoping one of those Fs would have been a D. Not that it would have changed anything. But my father was on the Academic Suspension Committee, which did him proud. And I just, it, the college just didn't make sense to me. Uh, my friends that I w had gone to high school with were working in the local paper mills, and they were driving GTOs, mm -hmm. and I was borrowing my father's Rambler station wagon. And um, um, after I got my notification from the school, um, I decided to join the Air Force at my father's recommendation. And that was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. Good, good. Where and when did that happen? Where did you, where did you enter the service, if you will? Um, it happened 14 days after I was out of college. Um, I had gotten my draft notice, and um, I looked at the opportunities. And the, the Air Force was always cool to me uh, mm -hmm. because my father was my A parochial, my, huh? yeah, my mentor, my hero, and uh, um, and many of us in the family after that joined the Air Force. Um, I joined. I signed up just a few weeks after I was out of school and then um, and that was in January and then April I was off to basic. What year? Um, that was 1966. Okay. April 3rd, 1966. And then I was stationed down at, at McDill Air Force Base in, uh, in Tampa and um, at the time I said, well, I still, I still got to get one of those GTOs and um, <laughs> I was making $91 a month Overpaid, huh? Yeah, and then I realized, you know, I could pick out probably about 100 bucks a month tax-free uh, with combat pay and uh, if I was, was in Vietnam. And I drove around to the local dealers, and I found uh, a 442 looked pretty good, Oldsmobile. So um, I volunteered, and um, in, in about a week after the time I put in the volunteer statement, I, I was notified that you're going, mm -hmm. and I had my orders for Saigon. Well. Before you leave the country, though, what kind of training did you have as far as any specialty, what your primary MOS, and that sort of stuff? Um, I was, uh, I was w wanting to get into, into um, something administrative, and I was in, in uh, air police, and I wanted to get into something that I could, that, that, that I could really build on um, that interested me. Mm -hmm. And I always had talked about accounting. And... Um, that was something that, that I thought maybe I might want to pursue. Um, when I was shipped overseas, I had the opportunity, because a slot came open, to go into finance, uh -huh. and I did. And uh, w one of the perks was the fact that the, the office was air conditioned, which was not a bad deal in Vietnam. Amen, amen, yeah. Okay, uh, what, uh, was your, I, I guess it, it, I'm trying to figure out the best way to ask it, but what did you do in Nam? Because I've heard all kinds of stories. Some, some of the guys were scared the heck out of you and others that were just um, a regular job. It was, what was life like? It, Where did you land when it, you got there? It was, I, was, I was immediately put on the quick reaction team okay. um, for Tanchanut. Tanchanut was, was, um, was headquarters for military, uh, for military assistance. We, we call it MACV, mm -hmm. Military Assistance Vietnam. Okay. command and um, uh, it was a huge sprawling base and um, it was um, we had mi um, military transports fighters and the whole deal and um, I was put on a um, uh, on a group that was to back up the security police mm -hmm. in the case that that the base was attacked uh, the first six months over there uh, there was an occasional rocket that was that was yeah, set in land. yeah land. and they, they would they would say it was um, it was three months of sheer boredom interrupted by uh, 30 seconds of terror yeah um, 
all that stopped um, when Tet Offensive hit. And um, prior to Tet Offensive, we had started breaking down sandbags. We had sandbags up against the buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, the decision was made that it looked too much like a war zone. And we, the feeling was we were much better control than we might have been. So we went on a base beautification project. We planted shrubbery and trees and took the, many of the sandbags down. Uh, December 30th, or January 30th, at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, we were rocketed by probably 150 rounds. Um, some direct hits, some misses, took out planes on the flight line, leveled our brand new church and killed uh, some of the people that were, that were sleeping in their barracks. Um, and then we were hit by three divisions on our, um, on our west perimeter. And it was at night, and it was Tet, which was, which was their lunar holiday. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. everybody was, um, was in a holiday mode, and we just figured this was going to be a quiet night. Now, and during the night, um, we had picked up uh, some security um, uh, briefings that there may be some activity. Maybe. Um, and um, all of a sudden, what was considered impossible in Tanchanut, uh, Tanchanut was just right out of Saigon. Uh, the general feeling was that, that it would be impossible for the enemy to mount such an attack that could, that could really um, have an impact on our perimeter mm -hmm. because, uh, because it was all uh, sprawling housing around it. Um, but what they did was they were able to put together three divisions in a textile mill just right across Highway 1, which abutted our perimeter. And w one of the primary plans that night was, was to take Tanshanut and MACV headquarters uh, that controlled the whole war. And they planned on hitting a, uh, an R van, the, the Vietnamese Army mm -hmm. um, armored unit, which was storage area just right outside our base, and their artillery unit. And they were trained to run the tanks and to take the tanks yeah. and come in come on back. the front yeah. perimeter and come in with, with, with these land forces uh, right after the shelling took place. Well, they did take the command, the, uh, the depot, but the tanks were gone, which was great for us. The base was loaded with unarmed people. Um, we are, uh, except for quick reaction team, our guns were in storage boxes because the Air Force felt it's probably secured. Yeah, yeah, you were secure. <laughs> oh, oh. You're going to do more damage to yourselves yeah. running around with these things than than uh, you would. So they're there if we need them. And um, at three o'clock in the morning, I was woken up by what at first thought was a was an incredible thunderstorm, um, and I realized it was it was a rocket yeah. attack. And and strangely enough, as as I hit the floor. I smelled this sweet perfume, and I couldn't understand where that came from. I found out later it was a storage box of right guard that took a direct hit <laughs> and uh, filled the air. It was, uh, That's good advertising, it, huh? It was, and, um, and we came close to losing the base. We had, um, w our, the quick reaction team was scrambled. The 377th, which has got a uh, security place, which has really gone down in history, um, probably 500 troops went out and saw this swarm of, of North Vietnamese regulars and Viet Cong that had broken through the perimeter. And we had, we call, it was called the 051 bunker. It was, it was an old f um, fortified French bunker that we had five security police in. And five personnel or five, five companies? Five personnel. Uh, they had the BRM machine guns. Okay. And they were throwing out so much firepower that the enemy couldn't get close enough to them to put them out of commission. They were going around them. And the problem was that we couldn't get ammunition to them. So we had, the Army had, had a uh, huge helicopter pad. We had Hueys going in, um, shooting at the enemy and trying to drop ammo into the bunker, yeah. and they were having limited success. After about two hours, the barrels, the, the barrels of the machine guns, which needed to be changed, were melting, and they resorted to M16 fire. 
And when that happened, the ring got closer and closer and closer, and they were finally able to knock out the 051 bunker. At that point in time, the security police had pulled back several times, and the, the enemy had, had reached the runway. And they had satchel bombs for the, for the airplanes. And, um, but the security police, they would move back, and they were putting, up, putting out so much fire that it really slowed the process when you think of how much they, they were outnumbered. Um, by accident, the 25th Armored Division was scrambling to head towards Sholan in downtown Saigon, where fighting was happening. And when they crossed our perimeter, they ran into what they thought was a yellow jacket's nest. They actually drove right into the attack wow. um, of the base, and it wiped out the whole first third of the column. Uh, that slowed the advancement. And then their commander, who had been flying over with a Huey, realized what was happening and had the rest of the column pull in and circle in on the, on the base. And they worked with the security police and the quick reaction team, and people on the ground didn't really know what was happening. They just did what they were told, and they actually got them in a crossfire. And by 5 o'clock in the morning, it was pretty well secured. And uh, the enemy it, retreated, and there were hundreds of, of, uh, of enemy that didn't. And the base was secured. From that point forward, it was, it was war at Tanchanuk from, the time, uh, from that time until I left in May. Um, there were f the funeral, we had a cemetery that abutted our perimeter. And they held funerals, and what they were doing is they were bearing rep weapons at the grave sites. They, the, the Viet Cong. Cong, okay. And they would come in <clears throat> and dig the weapons up and then hit our, hit our perimeter. Um, so from that point forward, a lot, I lost a very good friend, uh, Paul Connor, who's, um, who was in the 101st Airborne, who helped that sweep after, after the base in the Saigon area was cleared. He was killed, and he's featured in the, in the painting uh, if you happen to see it on, uh, on West Housatonic Street, on oh, the yeah, mural. On the mural. Yeah, he's, he's the guy with the helmet with a 14 on the front. And uh, he, was, he was killed rescuing um, one of his friends that were hit um, and was, received the Silver Star. The folks in the bunker, they were all killed, all received posthumously the, the Silver Star. But that fighting unit um, did a great job. And the Army, um, the, the security police held, held the war off until the Army was able to, to take it over and, Great. and secure the area. And the floodlights went on in the sand quarry and the bags got filled. And the, real and the, quick. Oh, real quick. Shell, shelling was going on while that was happening. But um, Strangely enough, it, it, uh, from the time I, uh, I, I left in May, when I was leaving, I was sitting on a pink Braniff 707 waiting for a contracted World DC Airlines DC-8 to take off, and the, ba the base was under attack. And the World DC-8 was sitting on the runway, and I was, we were waiting to get in position. And we could see as, as this A1E Sky Raiders would take off, we'd see the, tra the blue tracers going up, which is 50 caliber yeah. machine guns. We sat there for about three hours, and the Hueys would go in, and they would pound, and the jets would, 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 would pound, and then you'd see the tra tracers going up again. Finally, we got a, a clearance. The DC-8 took off, and as soon as he broke ground, you could see the tracers just oh, coming yeah. up like crazy. Of course, this would never make the paper back then. And we took off and banked sharply and didn't go over the end where the, where the enemy was, and we followed the DC-8, um, who flew below 10,000 feet, didn't pressurize the cabin. And, and both of us, both planes went into Clark, and he was riddled, the hole underneath of the, the baggage department. Nobody was hit, but the plane was out of commission, and they had to wait for another charter. Ours was fine, so we went on to Hawaii. But uh, it was an interest, interesting experience. Yeah, and the, and the strange thing that you mentioned, without thinking about it, I think, is that a lot of these things will never and have never been reported. For what reason, we don't seem to know. But No, um, they... they, they kept uh, pretty close wraps on what went out to yeah. the press uh, and uh, something like that with the airliner being shot at uh, and I'm sure it happened more times than oh yeah than well, we, that. one of the gals uh, <laughs> Howard Miner's wife was uh, a Mac 
stewardess, you know, military mm -hmm. head charter, no insignia, and just the first flight. <laughs> That's another story, but it was scary. They came in on both sides. I, I, I envision it, if you can straighten me away, one long, narrow thing with hills along the side, and that's where they were shooting yep. from the rockets. Yep. It was a bowling alley. Absolutely. And you took a good chance. You got a gutter ball, you were safe. Yeah. Yeah. Now, back up a bit, though. A lot of people have heard reference to, or I have anyway, uh, QRT. Can you give us an idea what that is? requirements were to become qualified or selected for QRT and what it means. Really. Uh, quick reaction team means that that um, you are trained to um, handle an M16. Um, you are trained um, and, and drilled um, and practiced going out and and working with the security police. They were the first line. We were the second line. And um, if if the security police retreated, they would come back to, to our trench. Okay. Um, we were treated. Um, uh, we, we we were we were taught, um, of course, everything that we had we had learned in w using the weapon uh, prior to going over, and um, we were taught how to function as a team, how to how to get the ammo passed out quickly, how to how to load and reload. Um, we qualified. Uh, continue to qualify in practice in, in terms of uh, the firing range yeah. for, for, for accuracy and to do it safely in a way that we weren't shooting our, our because we were tech, we were technical troops and uh, when 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 you were mustered on the quick reaction team um, you were part of the defense of the base uh, unfortunately um, the way they took us into position was probably not what we were on a loaded on a flatbed tractor trailer which is which <laughs> and headed out to the runway which was an Our enormous target on the line. right and then we we were just dropped at at, at various points okay. and we took and we took the orders from the air police um, and and from there um, we uh, we in, we came back into the base proper when the when the attack was over and um, we had snipers um, that we thought had infiltrated the base um, from the attack. And it actually turned out they didn't. They were, they were um, people that worked on the base, Vietnamese that worked on the base, that were actually VC. And they had, the night prior, they had, had found a hiding yeah. place, uh, found where the weapons <coughs> were, were uh, stored. Some of the folks were able to get in over the perimeter. Um, from the, the from the airport, and I was able to I experience kind of firsthand what um, what the concern was with friendly fire. Um, had a situation. I was walking out of a, a building, and um, it was noon, and automatic rifle fire opened up, and it was zinging on the pavement, and and everybody hit the dirt, and. And then I realized that this is probably not a good thing because it was coming from the, we had two very large radar domes for the airplanes. They were probably 75 feet high. And it looked like it was coming from the first radar dome. Oh. And we were sitting ducks out there laying in the grass uh, with someone looking down on us. So I, was, I and several others were able to make it back into a ditch. And one overzealous um, Air Force person, um, grabbed his M16 and went, didn't wait for instructions, went charging up the stairs into up the, the dome. up to the dome. And around the dome, there were triangular windows that you could step inside. There was four, on each, one on each mm -hmm. side. And he stepped into one from the catwalk and walked inside. And we were all covering him from that front triangular window. And we were expecting that, to, that we might see the enemy, because certainly he would be confronting the enemy mm -hmm. inside. All of a sudden, this face came out in that front window, and thankfully I didn't fire. That was the guy? But a lot of people did, and it was him. And there was no sniper in that tower. It was a tower behind it. Oh. And it was just, it was that under pressure, um, in a situation where you're not following orders from people that that give structure to this, yeah. um, that that people just panic and react in, in in close quarters, and and you end up killing people, your own people. And we shot an awful lot of night at tin cans. 
Yeah, yeah. The shadows, yeah. You, you go right through them, but yeah. still they were there by God. That's, that's exactly it's right. It's scary. Yeah. Now, did they get the guy in the second tower? Yeah. Long before this person was shot. Good deal. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was, it was an experience. And, and you know, I, um, it's, it's amazing. Younger people, I was 20, um, you, you get scared, but you don't appreciate it to the degree that our bosses did who were in their 40s and had families. The old timers. The old timers, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and maybe that's why wars, war um, front lines yeah. are, are packed with people in, in that younger, yeah. younger group because they, they feel like they're invincible. Uh, but the, the wake up call, especially in the contrast with a base that seems so secure, uh, that really was a technical work environment uh, about getting planes off the ground, to realize that somebody's trying to kill me, yeah. and they're doing it in big numbers. Um, that's where all that training, you're trying to remember what you did and, mm -hmm. and what you were taught to do and practiced. Um, and that's, that's a reality that you probably don't ever forget. Yeah. Well, it's instinctive, and the best part about it is, as you say, though, no matter how young and invincible you are, all of a sudden that light goes on. Yeah. And the ones, the ones that we used to say, you know, if only I didn't have this belt buckle, I could have got down a half inch closer yes, to the ground. Yes, exactly. And people look at you, oh, what do you mean by that? Yes, it, get out there and they'll, they'll show you. That's exactly, you can't, you can't shrink enough. Right. Something else that struck me, and, and I've always thought about this, is how great the American GI is. Um, the, the, they've always been an incredible fighting force, but, but honorable. I saw more acts of kindness um, and just plain fair play on the part of the, um, the American GI, the GI yeah, yeah. That, um, that really made you feel proud. I mean, the, some, of these, some of these folks um, a lot of them on their spare time would would work with orphanages that were maybe 20 miles downrange, mm -hmm. and it was a risk. Um, we would we would raid the refrigerators uh, with clearance, and uh, we'd pack up food, building materials, um, and pack a sidearm and, and a, a 38 and an M16, and hop in an Air Force vehicle and go on out to the orphanages that we had adopted mm -hmm. and w just with self-help, rebuild the buildings, uh, put in windows, bring food out there, clothing. And a lot of these guys would, would write to their family and say, can you send over some clothes? I got this yeah. little kid. And they would do that. And that's how they would, that, that's how they would decide to, uh, to spend their time. In fact, I was so blown away by it, I wrote a letter to the editor from Tan Chanute and they put it in the Berkshire Eagle Good. Uh, about that. It was just, it was, it was just, it was, it was rewarding to see that. Yeah. And the friendships that we developed with the, uh, with the Vietnamese people uh, that worked side by side with us. Yeah. Same thing, well, this is your story, not mine, but you, <laughs> uh, we did the same thing over in Okinawa. You'd be surprised how many times we very carefully emptied the, our mess kits in a clean GI bucket and watch the natives come by with their buckets yeah, yeah. to scoop it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, people won't believe that. No, it brought, brings to mind, I remember in the first Desert Storm, uh, uh, Desert Shield, uh, when, when uh, we liberated Kuwait, I remember watching when, that, when the, the big push happened and just the destruction that was taking place on that road back to ba Baghdad. And I remember seeing a, um, an army uh, probably a spec four uh, that took his M16 out and th this this enemy soldier just threw his hands up and his gun down guns down and, and went down on his knees and the guy dropped back his yeah. weapon and he said it's okay it's okay yeah. and just that act of compassion I saw that a lot mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to kill that's bad news yeah. no matter what yeah so I think, you know, from there, um, um, I think that that, the, the, that experience of my life changed my life for the better. Um, I learned 
I learned responsibility. I learned that I wasn't going to make a living playing fun, fun, fun. And um, the military, the government returned that favor um, in giving me the opportunity to go back to school. And I know how many people have experienced the same thing, yourself included. Oh, heck yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, baby. Yeah, and, and the, the very same school that I'm now a dean at, uh, that I flunked out, and I think I'm probably the only one on our executive <laughs> council that has those <laughs> bragging rights, but um, that I was able to go back, and that's the beauty of the community college, and put it all back together. Yeah. And um, my yeah. father was still there teaching. Yeah. And, uh, and, and after my, cur uh, my um, career in business, I ended up teaching there uh, the year he retired. And having GIs as my students, and my father always said, the greatest thing in the world is to, is to look at your schedule and go into your class the first day and, and find out in your classes that you have veterans mm -hmm. because they're the greatest students. They're, they're focused, um, they're ready to learn, and, they're, and you just know they're going to go out and be a smash. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Like your dad, I had, what, 14 years at BCC. Oh. Nights and summers and so forth. And well, I had several guys call me all kinds of things at the beginning of the class, but the best, and I'm taking time now. Many years ago, walking down North Street, some fella came by and he whacked me in the back and said, Hi, Mr. Stevens, how are you? I looked and I couldn't have told you his name. He gave me a dollar a moment. I said, I'm sorry, but I don't recognize you. Could you? Yeah, I was in your speech class. Uh, yeah. Boy, at the time I thought you were a real SOB, but I did what you told me to do and I've got a good job and I want to thank you. Yeah. That made the slate clean as a bell, the best part. Oh, it's, this is your story, but this is my no, life. No, that's, that's the story. That's, that's, oh, that's exactly part. it. That's, yeah. what, that's, what, that's what the college has always been about. And, um, and the military <clears throat> folks that have gone through there and are in key positions all around this county, and, and I, I will guarantee you, much better as a result oh, yeah. of that experience. Because um, they knew what they wanted. They knew what they wanted. And yeah. um, um, my father, who was, a, who was an Air Force uh, career officer, um, pilot, retired lieutenant colonel, um, and, and taught many, many folks out there, and he was head of the history department. And um, I had just the greatest opportunity after I was a professor for about probably eight years, to have, it was a year after my father died, to have the phone ring um, at my mother's house, and someone, someone with a German accent asking for my father. And my mother said, no, he passed away. And they said, oh, that's too bad. We've researched his bomber from World War II. It's in, it's in a little museum in a small, oh. tiny town called Bebelsheim, and we would like to invite you over. And my father, when he was a, he was a prisoner of war, he, he was a great drawer, and he drew this wartime log of all his experiences. And I remember a picture of his burning B-17 just after he had bombed Ludwigshafen, of the engine on fire and everybody jumping out in this little tiny town with a church with a round steeple. And uh, I said, we're going to go over there. So my wife and my mother and I went over. And they met us. And the people that invited us just treated us uh, as family. But you could see it was a little town out in Sarland, um, way away from the commercial areas. Uh, it was like as if a bomber had, had just gone into a field in Richmond. It was a very tiny, open field country, and it was the biggest thing that ever happened. And the townspeople were wondering, wonder what ever happened to those people? Because mm -hmm. my father was picked up and paraded into the local jail before they shipped him off to the prison camp. So we went over. We met the actual people that talked to my father in, in the jail. when wow. uh, they, were, they were leading him down um, uh, the streets uh, to just a local one one uh, cell jail with his co-pilot next to him. And um, we were able to go back to that church. And it's a round steeple, just like uh, he, he drew it. And they had a reception for us. And they presented my mother, and I have it out at Berkshire Community College, um, a table centerpiece made out of the parts from his B-17 oh. and mounted into the melted cylinders. 
uh, with an American flag and a German flag and a picture, September 13th, 1944, of a burning B-17 going down. Nosing in. Uh. Nosing in. And, and at the final day reception, mm -hmm. um, one gentleman who was very emotionally in, uh, uh, affected by this came over and he said, hold your hand out. And he dropped this bearing in my hand. He said, you know what that is? And I said, yeah, it's a bearing. He said, you know what kind of bearing? I said, I think it's a Fafner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, said, it's, he said, it's off your father's B-17, the landing gear. Oh. And I said, wow, that's great. He said, and just as he said, just as he began to speak, the church bell rang. And he got very, very emotional. And he said, that's your father's landing gear bearing. And, it was, the, uh, the, he said, it's the other wheel. He said, when Patton's Third Army came, through that village, there was so much damage that the bell ringer was destroyed. Okay, the clapper. So they used from in, from 1944 until now, and still ringing. They used the B-17 bearing to ring that church bell, and it was really a symbol of of a war machine turned into something yeah. good. Uniting the people. Uniting the people. And what's interesting is, is as we walked down through the village, people would peer out the windows. And we found out there was a lot of discussion. Why are you harp? These were terror fleegers family, uh, terror flyers. And we had sent them over a whole write-up that the college had done about my father as a professor, mm -hmm. as, as a, lear a person that you facilitated learning. That was the healing device. And the people that had harbored um, bad feelings and bitterness for years, uh, as th their lead person said, it vanished like the morning mist. And they realized these aren't people that we want to hate. These are friends. These are people that have families just like us. Right. And um, it was a major healing component for them. And, and it was the college component that was, the Berkshire Community College component that made people see that, that we're all people. Oh yeah, and we all we all cherish our our, our children's futures, yeah. and and uh, it was a wonderful experience. Talking about the kids, uh, I believe you were married. And what was your life like when you got married? When were you married? And what's happened to your family? Well, are your kids in the services, or are they old enough yet? No? Um, well, actually, um, I, I have one son who didn't go in. Um, and uh, that was a, a time period where we weren't fighting any wars. Oh, too bad. Um, but my, my uh, nephew uh, was, uh, was in, in Iraq. He was Air Force. And my niece, uh, who's still in the Air Force, uh, Chief Master Sergeant, um, she was in the first um, uh, Kuwait liberation. And um, I ended up getting out of the service. Um, a couple months early to go back to Berkshire Community College, and I married my um, my high school sweetheart. Well, um, yeah. What, what was the year? It was. Time -wise. It was um, 1970. Uh, well, 1970, I got out, and I married. I got married in '72, and uh, we're still married and still living in Beckett. Oh, back in the hills. Back in the hills, we yeah. we uh, we built a house right on the property of the old Mulholland uh, homestead, and. Uh, <laughs> I've been there happily ever since and working yeah. in the college. One of the questions we've been asked to get your reaction to, based upon what you said, uh, what's your assessment of your war experience or your service experience? Was it positive or negative as far as how it impacted what you've done and how you're living today? Um, it, Is that a fair question? Yeah, and it's not an easy question. It, it's, and uh, I, the answer is absolutely, it was a, it was a positive experience. It was a positive experience for me, not just because I grew out of it, but, but it, experiencing being in a military that did some things wrong, uh, were mortal, but was really trying to do something right. Um, was a sense of fair play, um, what I have seen paraded in the, the, the me lies, which are horrible um, tragedies and, and evil, mm -hmm. um, that is absolutely not characteristic of the United States military. Um, people, uh, th those things do happen, but I was just very impressed with the honor of the military. Um, 
and the impact that our military had on our allies. Um, that, uh, and, I th and I think we're, we're starting to see it in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, that, that slow but sure. That closeness. Um, we make mistakes, but but I think our intentions, uh, at least from my foxhole, were were good. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's terrific that that the that the veterans have the opportunity to financially to be able to go back and to take a, at a higher level of wisdom and experience. Um, to pick the kind of education they want and, and go on and make a, uh, a greater impact on society than they would have otherwise made had they yeah, not been a veteran. A positive impact. Yep, yep. Yeah. So I just, um, I wouldn't have traded my military experience for anything. Good. Now, uh, when you got out, did you join anything like the VFW, the American Legion, AMBETS, DAB, or are you still a, an unassociated guy? Well. I did, really ask it that I, way. I did join the VFW. I never went to a meeting, but I, uh, my father um, uh, was, was one of the point people, he and Ken Gillette, who was in the American Legion, in running our little Beckett Memorial Day. And I do that now. I've got a singing group, and I organize the parade, and we get the flyovers out of barns, and, and um, that's just my little military side of, of putting it back. Good. Um, and I'll always do that. Yeah. If they say it's a Rockwellian day, huh? Yeah, that's exactly right. Nothing fancy. Yep. Uh, well, <laughs> we're, uh, we're starting. I'm, I'm recruiting right now a VFW post in Lenox. They're reinstituting it right now. And we had the annual parade, you know. And if you're familiar with the town, we start at the church on the hill and walk down Main Street to the center. Uh, one of the guys said, you know, it's a dang good thing that we're marching down because if we're going up, I wouldn't be with you. See, there you go. That's all right. <laughs> but they were there, not ragtag, but I don't think there were two guys in step out of the 400. No, I think, I think it's incredible. And you see the tears coming down the, their eyes and oh, yeah. saluting the flag. And uh, my family has 21 Studebakers, which makes no sense. Um, but we do. And we... They're part of that parade. We have, you know, maybe four or five oh, in the, the parade. Huh? Yeah, and uh, and the veterans that have a hard time walking, we just pack them in the yeah. Studebakers. But we get them, we get them down to get the down memorial up, site yeah, anyway. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Well, this has been great, and uh, I guess the best way I can say it is, do you have any words of wisdom or enjoyment to, do, to tell the young guys and gals coming along? what they might be able to do should they join the service or they're on the cusp and not sure what they're coming down. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I would advise um, anybody that, that, I was going to say doesn't have the resources, but if you qualify for a Pell Grant, we can get you free tuition to BCC. So, um, <clears throat> and pay for your books. Uh, but s somebody who's, who is, doesn't feel that they're ready for college for whatever reason. Um, they don't know where they want to, what direction they want to go in. They couldn't do better than, than to pick a military, check them all out, and pick one that sounds appealing to them and, and look at the schooling opportunities. Yeah. yeah. Look, at, look, at, uh, look at the kinds of, of jobs that you can get. Who'd ever thunk the Air Force would teach me accounting? Um, but that became my profession. I became an accounting professor. And go in and get that experience and pick up that wisdom and sense of responsibility and sense of teamwork. Um, your values even improve. And then when you get out, go on a pathway of lifelong learning. And, and I'm the dean of lifelong learning. And um, go back to school. And you will, f you will not recognize that student that's sitting in your seat. Um, you have so much more to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And you will learn so much more than if, had you not had that experience. And when you look in your rearview mirror, 10, 20 years downrange, you'll say, boy, that was the best thing I ever did. I might even yeah. come on television and talk about it. OK, well, if you want to, come on back. Yeah, well, I might. <laughs> Man says, thank you. thank you for coming. And thanks thank for, for asking with me. me. My pleasure and our pleasure. Thank you. Folks. That's another one in the can, if they say. But again, it's another example of what we're trying to do. Anyone, guys or gals particularly, if you have a story to tell about what you did, don't be bashful and don't shrug it off as you'll do it later. 
come and see us. We'll do what we can to make it worth your while and fill another little part of the thing we call the light of history. Bob Stevens again saying thank you. Stay well. Come and see us. Goodbye.